hope everyone is doing well today. Um, we are really excited to be back. I missed you guys last week. It was strange not having, I had like a Wednesday and I didn't, I wasn't on live with all of you. It was very odd. Um, so we are really excited um, to be back. Um, we have this wonderful presentation today on sustainable habitats. And then we're doing one more next week um, with Paige, who's actually on with us today. Hi, Paige. Um, and she's going to be talking all about um, bird habitats on rooftops and how we can use those to be more sustainable as well. Um, so that'll wrap up our sustainability series. And then we are in the works right now to do um, a birding series um, about different issues with birds, um, probably starting in, in January. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, all right, let me get us started here. Um, I do need to mention that um, this wonderful series is brought to us thanks to the lovely support of Visit Bucks County, um, who um, gave us a wonderful grant to do um, work with sustainability. So we're very appreciative of that. Um, and definitely, if you haven't been out to our property lately, come on out. The grounds are still open, dawn to dusk. Um, every day. So we'd love to see people out. We've had this huge surge over the last week or so. Um, and the nice weather around Thanksgiving and people having um, visitors in town has really um, increased the number of people we had. So it's been really great to see lots of lots of people outside engaging with nature. So Alrighty, um, we are really excited to have Barbara back with us today. Um, Barbara is actually one of our the members of our board of um, directors and she um, is an amazing gardener and really um, there's just a ton about birds and pollinators and really creating wonderful habitats for them. So I am going to shut up and I will turn it over to, to Barbara and um, hopefully learn a little bit myself. So, so take it away, Barbara. Okay, let me just share my screen. Uh, share computer sound, right, Stacy? That was it. And share. Can everyone see the presentation? Yep, yep, it looks great. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for joining me today. I'm really excited about this topic. This is something that's really near and dear to me. Uh, a little bit of just background. Um, I was formally trained many, many years ago as a biologist and ecologist. And then I wandered over to the dark side of the world of pharmaceuticals when I uh, started a career. So I've been away from this, but it's always been close to me in the sense that when I had free time, I would always go in the woods or if I had some space, I would garden a bit. But it's really been the last 10 years where the context and the basis for this presentation has come about. And that's because I moved into this beautiful home in Bucks County to, uh, I moved my dad in with me and it had lots of space and the landscaping, there was really nothing there. So this became a labor of love. So the things I am sharing with you today come from learnings, formal learnings that I, I've taken, but it also comes from a lot of trial and error um, and experience over the last 10 years. So with that in mind, um, the program is about sustainable backyard habitats for birds and pollinators. And this, you know, remember Field of Dreams, build it and they will come. And this is meant for everyone, regardless of your property size. Uh, you could have a, a, a patio with just a little area, or you could have acres of land. So let's just start. Um, before I go into it, uh, and Stacy did just mention this, that Paige next week will have the last presentation of the series on sustainable rooftops for birds. And I'm, I'm so glad she's joining us today as well. So what are we going to essentially cover today? Uh, we're going to go over and discuss like what is meant by a sustainable habitat? Why is it important? What are the components or the elements of it? What you can do to build a sustainable habitat and resources. This presentation is meant to be a high level overview to get people started. Now, some of you may know a lot about this already. Hopefully you will glean something from this presentation, but it is meant um, to be universal and really enjoyed by everyone. And by the way, if you have any questions during the course of the uh, presentation, please 
interrupt and ask. Um, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, I hope, Stacy, you can keep track of the chat just in case someone uh, comes up with a question. Absolutely. Okay. So what is a sustainable habitat? Well, uh, here are a few photos of different types of sustainable habitats. Basically, it's an ecosystem that provides for the needs of an organism without depleting its resources. So what does that mean? It means that it is in balance, that things that are taken from the ecosystem, be it food or susten sustenance, whatever, in some way, shape or form, something is given back to it. So such a sustainable habitat, it may be produced naturally. Matter of fact, <laughs> our earth, before we really came on board was this very sustainable habitat. So it's produced naturally, or it could be man-made. And if it is man-made, the, the rule of thumb is really, it will mimic nature as much as possible to be, to be successful. And so why are these backyard uh, sustainable ha habitats in backyards important? Well, this really kind of sums it up. Hel I mean, healthy habitats overall equals healthy ecosystems, which equals balance. Everything is in balance. These things that you see around the circle here are what are called uh, kind of, you know, you have ecosystem services. What is provided by the ecosystem? If you have a system in balance, chances are your erosion, there is erosion prevention already in place. There is nutrient cycling and soil fertility in place. Um, you will have pollinators um, there, depending on the environment. And it, it, is, it is really a system in balance and both people can benefit from it and wildlife can benefit from it. So it's kind of a cohabitation. It's not one above the other or one or the other. We're all very familiar, too familiar, I'm afraid, with large scale habitat destruction. There's your clear cutting that um, still occurs in a lot of the, uh, of the world of burning and large parts, you probably heard this a lot when we're talking about the Amazon, <laughs> thousands of acres are being depleted um, and, and cut down. And it's really just a tragedy. You have your plastics in the ocean. You have things such as strip mining uh, that really defaces the land and just pulls resources out and gives nothing back. And even our form of agriculture, our monocultures of plants, where you have thousands of acres of genetically similar corn, it's, it's a desert. This is, it's a destruction of the natural habitat. And you see more farmers beginning to grow crops in a more sustainable way. But in addition to large scale habitat destruction, we have small scale habitat destruction. And one of the largest contributors to this is lawns. Lawns came about in, uh, in like the 1700s and it was a sign of status and it was a sign of wealth. And if you go um, have the uh, lucky enough to travel overseas and go to especially the UK and other places and go to castles, you'll see they have expanses of lawn. They will also have some nice gardens, don't <laughs> they certainly will, but lawn. Lawns, if I could have one takeaway message from this presentation, lawns are like deserts. They have really no ecological value. So they may look very pretty and they do provide CO2 to the environment, yet it doesn't give anything back to nature in any significant way. It certainly doesn't benefit birds or pollinators at all. So what are the benefits of building habitats that we can all do? Well, on a large scale, and this might be like a community or like 
uh, putting aside a, a, a marine preserve or a natural preserve or a national park. You can create sustainable habitats to really help restore the damage that we've already wrought on the planet. So there are initiatives going on, even things like the Heritage Conservancy, where they are buying properties. They're trying to bring things and protect and save things. So it brings balance back to our lands on a large scale. But on a small scale, it really is within the reach of everyone and every community to begin to create sustainable habitats on a small scale in our backyards, in our communities, in our schools, our churches, whatever. There are thousands of opportunities we can consider converting even a small part of your lawn to habitat creation, especially if you have a small part of your lawn that's done and you're, or you're improving on it and your neighbor does and your neighbor does. Just think of this. You're building up all these connections that uh, both pollinators and birds can benefit from. The big piece of this is replacing or supplementing current plantings with native plants. And I'll talk a little bit more about native plants. So um, uh, another takeaway message from this is individuals can make a difference. You don't have to have acres of land and seed them with wildflowers to make a difference. So if there's one real big takeaway message, that's it. So, where we want to go is we want to have from unhappy birds and bees and an interesting looking lawn more to happy birds and bees and something that looks more akin to this little wildflower patch. Some of you might remember Maslow. Uh, if you've taken psychology at all, you remember Maslow's hierarchy where every level of need has to be met before you can go up to the next, um, next level. Well, for all forms of life, be it human or plants or animals, the bottom two apply across the board to everyone. We all need to have physiological needs met and we all need to have uh, safety and security before we can progress and, and build. So how do we provide for safety and security for birds and pollinators? How we do it is creating pockets of habitats where they can thrive. So let's talk now a little bit about creating actually creating sustainable habitat. There are four requirements, and this goes for, regardless of birds or pollinators that you're talking about or wildlife. Everything needs food. It needs water. They need places to breed, and they need shelter. And if the more of these that you can accommodate in your backyard habitat, the more fruitful it will be and the more productive it will be. I'm going to talk uh, on a bit about native plants going forward. And so for those of you, many of you may be quite familiar with native plants. By the way, native plants, if you go back, were always called weeds. I think um, when I was growing up and all, they would say, oh, there's another weed, get that out of your lawn. And, and really what it is, is a, a native plant trying to come back and get a hold back in its environment. So native plants and trees are really those that are indigenous to a given area within a geologic time. So this includes plants that have either developed or occur naturally or existed for many years in an area. So your impatience and your petunias are really not native to us. Um, they are native somewhere, but certainly not to us. But your goldenrods and your milkweeds are. Uh, 
native plants tend to have very specific times when birds and pollinators can benefit from them. So unlike annuals that will flower throughout the season, uh, you might just have plants here that bloom in June, and then another set blooms in July, and the set that bloomed in June begins to look very sad. So um, that's why you really need to balance and give some thought about when you do plant, you know, what are you looking for? And we'll get more into this. So birds and pollinators also have plants that they favor. So not every plant will necessarily attract the creatures you want. So you do have to plan. But the good news is that a lot of the plants and the ones I'll share in this presentation are beneficial to both birds and pollinators. I'll say birds and the bees, birds and pollinators. If you want a wide variety of creatures, you're going to need a wide variety of plants, trees, and shrubs, and a larger space. So you need to consider what you want and plan for the space you have or are willing to set aside for your little habitat. And in some ways, if you don't have much space, it's better to have fewer plants and more of them than just a couple of many varieties. And you can imagine if, if you just have like one milkweed and a butterfly comes over and um, feeds on that milkweed, it's like maybe not even a snack for it. It has to go looking for more. But if you have a cluster of milkweeds, it can spend some time there and kind of really uh, become nourished. So for small spaces, it, it, this probably works better. But I don't want anybody to fret or say, oh my God, native plants, I got to think about when they bloom. I got to think about what I want, um, what animals I want to track. Please don't fret. There are a lot of resources available and I will share um, some of the best ones that I found with you uh, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, at this point, I just want to share a little video with you. So, um, oh, geez, this is no good. Let's see. Oh, here we go. And if we all plant for wildlife, we'll have a lot more butterflies and birds and bees. And myself personally, there's some things that I really like, especially, well, the cone flowers. And they're hard to come by, but I know you can get them at local nurseries, at least one local nursery that I know of. But it's beautiful that when the, uh, the goldfinches come around to eat the seeds. You don't have to put out the seeds or anything. You just plant the flowers and once, water them once or twice. You don't need fertilizer. And they'll grow and they'll attract so many different uh, birds. Well, our big issue right now is uh, the connectivity of parks and homeowners. So if you add native plants to your backyard, um, you're, you're part of the connectivity with the park. You don't have to be right next door to the park for the parks to benefit from your native plants. Then what you're doing is putting things in that benefit nature, like the birds, but at the same time, you're saving money. But over the long haul, when you don't have to replace them every year, you are doing yourself a lot of good, but more important, you are helping the environment. That is the key. Um, the movement towards native species has really become very popular. It's through groups like the protectors of pine oak woods and other uh, environmentalist groups that are just making it much more public, including the parks department making requirements of you going more native when they plant trees on a curb strip. The is that it helps attract our feathered friends. Um, it helps to provide a aesthetically pleasing environment. It helps cool the heat island effect in you know, like a lot of these hot areas. It's, I mean, it's a known fact that planting trees in urban situations not only affect people psychologically, but physically. And uh, we have over 25 species that are on the Auto um, Balance Society's list for attracting birds in the zip code. And um, 
we've been doing this for years because we, we always like to go with native plants on a, for Staten Island because they do well in this area. So if you bring in a lot of exotic species, they look nice, but they're, they're not meant for this environment. Sometimes it's a forced fit and it, and it causes problems. Okay, today we're gonna go take a look at some amelanchor, some eastern red cedar, some flowering cherries, and then some pines, as well as dogwood, and maybe some hawthorn. <laughs> How do I get out of this now? There we go. Oh, go back to the presentation. Can you still all hear me? Yeah? Okay. Okay. So that really, that little video clip summarized this presentation. And you heard the words connectivity, you heard the words native plants, um, and you heard the words that, you know, just it doesn't take much to, to begin and to start. And all native plants are either perennial or biennial. So they're gonna come back all the time and you don't have to uh, worry about having more and replanting more and more unless you're improving and you wanna add on. So let's talk now about, oops, do that. That wasn't. Let's talk now about those four elements that I said are necessary for any backyard habitat or any habitat to be sustainable. Food, water, uh, nesting places, and shelter. So on the right side, I'm kind of focused, uh, I'm sorry, on the left side, I'm kind of focused on birds. On the right side, I'm focused on pollinators, but you can really see in the middle that kind of satisfies both. So you could see that a lot of things do benefit both birds and pollinators. So food sources should be natural where possible, but they certainly can be supplemented. So for natural food sources, native trees and shrubs, native wildflowers, native plants that produce nectar um, and pollen. So nectar would be like your trumpet vines, um, your bee balms, that will do that. So for supplemental food for birds, we're all familiar and probably a lot of us, if not all of us, do this a lot. We have bird feeders, both seed uh, and nectar uh, feeders, suet, fruit, Birds love dry, some birds love dried mealworms, so that's always good. On the pollinator side, however, again, it's the more native plants that you attract. There's really no supplementary feeders, so to speak, for um, pollinators. If you have beehives, you supplement them in the wintertime with food. But other than that, they, they're pretty sustainable, but they need access to pollen and nectar. Water too uh, is, is critical. So you can see here that all of these items in the center of this slide satisfy the needs of both birds and pollinators, regardless of, of what you um, have. And your supplemental things are things that we add to the garden to enhance it. So water features and bird baths and drip faucets uh, all will work very well. For pollinators, uh, the best thing to do is to have some places that they can settle on or sit on so that they don't drown. Um, sometimes you'll see like uh, uh, if you just have like a, a bird bath, like is pictured here, you might see a lot of little insects or like honeybees or other bees drowning. They really need little places that they can perch on and, and sit um, while they are, are drinking. Shelter is super important and great things to plant for shelter are evergreens and conifers and hollies. I mean, they're nice and thick and birds can hide in them. Um, they're really great for both shelter and nesting. Hedgerows or bramble patches are great, especially bramble patches. If you have a part of your um, property that is kind of grown over with thickets and you don't need to do anything with that, don't clean it out, leave it. 
the birds will love you, love you for that. Log, brush, or rock piles, even um, you know dead trees. That's really great for for woodpeckers and for other birds. To supplement shelter, you can use even your discarded Christmas trees. I've been doing that every few years, putting them out and kind of building them up to make kind of like a log pile. Uh, you could actually put winter roost boxes out and roost boxes are different from nest boxes in that the hole is in the bottom, not on the top, so that when the birds are in there, the warm air kind of like rise, um, rises and kind of is contained a little bit better than if it was at the top where it would act like a chimney and all go out. Uh, but nest boxes um, also do protect them and some birds will go into them. For insects, uh, for pollinators, leaf litter, you, you're probably seeing leave the leaves. Leave the leaves if you can. Leaf litter is great for pollinators. Many of them, as well as amphibians and other critters, will burrow under the leaf litter for overwintering. Log brush again or rock piles and overwintering perennials. And the, the interesting thing about overwintering perennials is if you if you do cut some of them back, you'll notice a lot of them have like hollow cores and that's lots of times where the insect goes. And that's, I think the idea behind these insect houses, which are supplemental that a lot of uh, people are buying now uh, to support uh, native bees. Breeding, boy. Can't go on without that. So for birds, densely, and this aligns very much with what I described for shelter needs, densely planted native trees and shrubs, standing dead trees. You'll have woodpeckers galore, maybe even owls and all, meadows and grassland. Each of these are habitats that will attract specific types of birds. If you have the space, and can provide all three habitats, that's great. But maybe you only have um, a meadow or maybe you only have some planted uh, shrubs and trees, but that's, that's fine. Supplementally for breeding, you have nest boxes, um, what's called nest platforms or cups, or you can even have an accessible barn or outhouse where like swallows might go or other birds. For pollinators, there are very few pollinators that are social. That we, when we think of like um, bees, we think of honeybees lots of times and bumblebees. Well, these bees are social bees. That means there is a queen and they have workers and they either are in the ground or have a hive. Most pollinate, most um, native bees, and we have 4,000 bees in North America. Um, at the rate we're going, I don't know how many we'll have left, but we have about 4,000 and most of them are solitary and most of them will breed uh, in the bare ground. So, so if you have a little patch of bare ground, that's very helpful for them or hollow stems or holes in trees in which to lay their eggs. Supplemental, you can have, as I said, those insect houses, they will lay their eggs, some bees will lay their eggs in there, and hive boxes for honeybees, uh, if you are so inclined. This is a good example to show you that um, these are uh, common names of a number of native plants. And you can see on the right that they are beneficial to both birds and bees but at different times of the year. So if you have uh, something like uh, milkweed or um, uh, black-eyed Susans or bee balm, the pollinators will most likely are the ones that will benefit from that during the blooming season in the summer. But once those perennials have bloomed and they're past that, then the birds will benefit in the fall from the seeds. So you can address the needs of both. So as, as is noted here, most natives support birds by providing seeds in the fall, but some like actually salvia and bee balm provide nectar during their blooming season as well for hummingbirds. 
So I wanted to share with you some native plants that I have had tremendous success with. And in terms of success, I mean that they're hardy, they keep coming back, they're pretty tolerant of lots of different kinds of conditions, um, plus they're stunningly beautiful in their own ways. So while bergamot or while this is like a bee balm, um, beautiful. It also has a very mild fragrance. Pollinators love these. I have um, a little meadow of them and you walk by that meadow and you can hear the buzzing of all the different types of pollinators and hummingbird moths that go to these. Giant hyssop is also wonderful. They're not really super giant. They're several feet high. Um, they have like a licorice if you crush the, the leaves and the tea, it has a licorice scent. Pollinators love this too. And I've seen a lot of um, uh, goldfinches on these uh, to pick the seeds from them later in the, in the season. Now, this St. John's wort is something I just discovered two years ago, and it is wonderful. It is about uh, three feet high, um, pretty contained shrub. I have them all along the border of a big rock pile, boulder pile that I have. And these things, when they come into bloom, not only is it stunningly beautiful to see all these bright yellow flowers, but the bumblebees go crazy. It's like they fight over each other to get on these blooms. It is just, it's, it's a madhouse in June to see the bumblebees here. Black-eyed Susans, very common. You see them everywhere. Very hardy, lovely plants. This is a new, dis relatively new discovery for me, the beauty berries. And this is not Photoshop. These have beautiful, bright purple berries that the bees, uh, that the bees, that the birds just love to pick on. And I also have them kind of in a, uh, making like a border. Viburnums, you cannot go wrong with viburnums. They are great for providing seeds for birds. And here I have New England aster, but it doesn't have to be New England aster. Asters in general um, are well loved by pollinators. And it's also nice because they are late bloomers in the fall. And, and the point I want to bring up here that there's nothing wrong with mixing annuals and non-natives in your beds. If you want to sustain color over the year, over the summer months, like butterfly bushes or cultivars of bee balm or lavender, do it. You don't have to be a native plant snob. So you don't have to say it's native or nothing. You know, do what you can in your backyard. Just start the process and help the environment in little ways. So here are examples of um, some large scale habitats that you can create and some, uh, I'll also share some small scale habitats. So this is actually the meadow in my, on my property on the left upper here. And this is made up mostly of bee bombs, black eyed Susan. This meadow was started from seed. So it is about six years old now. And every season it surprises me with new plants that have arisen every season. And this is another type of a native meadow, but native meadows you can do, you can make little native patches pretty easily by clearing the ground and having, uh, clearing the ground and, and just having a good foundation for your seeds. Also large scale plantings, like here you see when we're talking about masses of plants, masses of, of hyssop or masses of black eyed Susans. So if you have a little more property, these are suitable things that you can do. Cottage style, wild looking or more formal style, you, use your imagination. These are examples of very small scale habitats. So look at this, a little patio here with just flowers around, uh, around it. You can use raised beds, you can use containers. If you have a patch that you could, look at this one on the lower right. It's like a lot of plants into a small area. So there's a lot you can do. Here's a very tiny backyard in the upper left and they've cleverly just put all around the perimeter they've made their plantings and left the center. So uh, don't be constrained by the size of the area that you wanna use. 
uh, you can create small, beautiful areas as well. The saving grace is if you're one of these people that just doesn't, you know, you're overwhelmed. You say, my God, I have to, I, I have to, what plant do I put where because it grows so high and when does it bloom? There are tons of garden plans out there. Just go ahead and Google them. And if you want to do more pollinator stuff versus bird stuff, you can. Here's an example on the lower left of a bird garden. They tell you what to plant, where to plant it, you know, when it blooms. Here's a monarch way station up here in the upper left. So there are many, many resources out there that you can use to help you. Um, and, and there are a lot more people that are doing this and experimenting. I think that's the word I want to use, experiment. If it goes wrong, it goes wrong. Um, and, and you tr try something different. Don't be afraid to start. At this point, I just want to share some resources that I found really very, very helpful. And I think you will as well. The first is National Wildlife Federation website. They actually have uh, one of their tabs is called Create a Sustainable Garden that Helps Wildlife. And it goes into food, water, cover, and young. And it really describes these things and has very helpful information to help you get started or to help you grow and expand your garden. The one I really love is Audubon because the Audubon website, you can put in uh, in their plant resources database, um, which is one of the tabs here, you can put in your zip code and it will populate with all the shrubs, plants and, and um, trees that will thrive in your particular zip code. And what's nice about it is that you can filter. So you can filter on the types of plants. If you wanna just say, I'm looking for a shrub, a particular shrub, or if you're looking for anything that uh, you want to attract, there's a tab, wh what are the birds you want to attract? You can plug that in and it will filter the plants out for you. So it, um, it even, in some of them, uh, for some of them, if you click the buy now, it'll even tell you a local nursery or online place where you can purchase the seeds or the plants. So this, this is a go-to one for me a lot, especially if I just want to add a few plants that to attract a particular type of bird that I haven't seen and I would like to try and attract, I'll frequently go to this. And the last one is Doug Tallamy's books, uh, Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope, uh, where he encourages people to do just what I've been presenting here in this past half hour. So I uh, really, my takeaways to you is experiment. Don't be afraid. There's a lot of resources out there. Just go and try it. Thank you very much. I'm open to any questions anyone may have or... Excellent. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, yes, um, so you can put your questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself um, and ask Barbara. Um, I'm sure she would be more than happy to, to take any questions. I'd like to uh, toss something in, um, in terms of birds and pollinators. Um, one of the things that, that does happen as we plant for both is sometimes the birds eat the pollinators. Um, <laughs> birds, birds need all of those caterpillars to feed their babies. So the more we have of both, <laughs> the more, you know, the more population we're going to have of both. But don't, I mean, just don't um, get too distressed if some of your pollinator caterpillars go to feed the baby birds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane, because you raised something that I was planning to talk about, but I forgot that you will, if you have it, especially for butterflies, you're going to see lots of caterpillars, but um, chickadees, what is it chickadees need? How many? 3,000 caterpillars um, in a, in a, for one nest, for one um, nest. So yeah, that's going to, but that's all part of the balance, isn't it? It's you're creating and you're benefiting and you're getting back. So thank you. Thanks for that. And, and you also need to be willing for your plants to get eaten. 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, the, the caterpillars are going to eat the leaves. So, you know, you have to be willing to have a little a little plant damage so that you can support the uh, the larval form of the of the pollinators. Right. And and another point that kind of goes along is that um, once they bloom, they don't look so pretty. <laughs> you know, they uh, the native plants that look kind of brown and like sticks. And but I encourage you if you if you um, want to really throw your heart into this, leave them. As a matter of fact. If, if you have something like a meadow, um, and Diane taught me this, I don't cut mine down now until like February because there are a lot of seeds there. So if you have to cut back, maybe cut back a few of them so insects can store. But, you know, if you don't mind the look, try and leave them. Anything else? Um, uh, and, and you can send me an email or whatever offline or later. I'm a bit um, easy to reach. So, yes. So, Barbara, I had a question, and this is more of a personal thing. Um, your meadow looks absolutely beautiful. Do you continue to add more seed, or it's just whatever comes back? No. Um, most of what comes, it depends on the year. I said it's about six years old. So, um, What's predominant every year is the wild bergamot. That comes back like, like gangbusters. And typically the black-eyed Susans do too. But what I'm finding is more and more like senna popped up. I never planted senna. I never planted mountain mint there. And that's coming up now. Um, or the last season, mountain mint came up. Different types of ironweed came up. I didn't, and goldenrod. So the natives are kind of coming in there and uh, it's giving a little diversity. But no, I, I just, um, I was originally cutting it back uh, like around the Thanksgiving time frame. Uh, but Diane made a suggestion. She mentioned that in her yard, she does in February, I believe. And so that's what I'm going to do now. So as I said, this is trial and error. This is a learning experience. It always you'll learn. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, wonderful. Well, Barbara, thank you so much. This was incredibly informative and just really great. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. So I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. So thank you. Um, as I mentioned before, we have one more week of our sustainability series um, next week with Paige talking about um, sustainable habitats on rooftops. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, and yeah, so we're really happy that you all joined us. Um, this recording will be up on our YouTube um, if you wanted to go back and, and watch it again. Um, that would be wonderful as well. So, so thank you all um, and have a great week. Thank you.